Thank you, Derek, for that very kind um, introduction, a little bit too kind. I wouldn't call myself an authority, <laughs> um, just a student on, on the path. I think it's, uh, it's more accurate. And good to see you all, uh, friends. I also see Janaki, uh, who I usually know from online, but I've never seen Janaki's face. So I'm actually really excited. Thanks to Anukampa, I'm actually getting to see a lot of like her friends. Because <laughs> usually uh, we do everything on YouTube. So we know names, but we don't know faces. Uh, so good to see your face, Janaki. And good to see all of you other friends that... Uh, I've met some of you have met already online here um, uh, through all these Anukampa series. So thank you again for, well, initially Venerable Chanda, who I'm very happy she's spending some time on retreat um, for a couple of months and that we're all of us bhikkhunis are able to support that, uh, even if we're far away. Um, and uh, thank you, Derek, uh, for and all the team, everybody, Matthias as well. Uh, everyone who is helping out supporting this beautiful project in the UK. I'm very honored to um, have been invited to, to talk a little bit about Dhamma here. And once again, uh, my congratulations for the new Anukampa Bikfudi Monastery in the UK. I'm very looking forward to seeing it in person. So um, maybe we can start our meeting as usual with uh, some meditation practice so we can get into a comfortable position. And we can make sure our back is upright. And we can take a few deep breaths. And we can start by relaxing our entire body. From the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Sending metta to any point of tension or any point in the body that aches. And we can spend a few moments just dwelling just being without anything to do without anything to accomplish. Just relaxing our minds from constantly thinking, constantly chasing things. Constantly doing something.
We can just allow ourselves to just be, to just occupy this space, to just breathe. being okay with any kind of emotion that comes up. And if the mind gets restless and tries desperately to find something to do, we can just find a part of the body that feels tranquil and peaceful. And we can just welcome and hold this element of tranquility in the mind. observing it and filling our mind with the element of tranquility.
And as we keep nurturing and embracing this element of tranquility in the mind, we can also start wishing for ourselves to always be tranquil and peaceful. When we're meditating on the cushion, or when we're meditating in the walking position, in the standing position, or when we're laying down, or when we're talking and interacting with others, going about our day, We can wish for ourselves to always be peaceful and tranquil. And opening our hearts and directing loving kindness towards ourselves, really meaning it, we can wish, may I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May I be happy. And we can expand the heart and wish for all the beings that perhaps we're sharing the room with at the moment, or all the friends that are on the other side of the screen meditating with us tonight or this morning or midday, wherever we are in the world. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May we all have happy minds and grow in wisdom.
And we can keep growing and growing and expanding our heart. Growing more and more loving kindness to include every single sentient being. Why would we wish to every anyone to be anything other than happy? May all beings be happy. Whether humans or non-human. Whether in this world or other worlds. Hume beings with bodies and without bodies. May all beings have happy minds. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May all beings attain blissful supreme Nibbana for their benefit and the benefit of others. May all beings be unconditionally happy. free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Free from birth, free from death. Wise and knowledgeable. May all beings attain awakening.
And we can intentionally hold dear, this lovely mind of loving kindness. Cherish it for a few more moments. Intentionally imbue our entire mind with these beautiful thoughts of loving kindness. And we can slowly come out of meditation practice while still keeping this mind of loving kindness. And we can open our eyes, put our hands in Anjali, and we can say three times, Sadhu, Sadhu, and you can now move your body if you need to and get more comfortable if you need to <laughs> All right. So to <clears throat> today that I believe it's tonight for mo most of you and um, it's midday <laughs> uh, for us in the United States, actually early afternoon. Um, today is the um, third part of the um, Tirigata series, and um, last time we had decided for a topic, so usually we don't pick a topic, <laughs> so I kind of improvise, and today we'll still improvise a little bit, but it will be on gender, so we do have um, a topic, and I was thinking about starting with... Um, the Soma Sutta, where I get my name from, and I'll put in the live chat, I'll put some links to Sutta Central. Uh, the first one is my translation of the Soma Sutta, or the Soma poem, rather. And then the second one is from the Bikuni Samyutta, so um, parallel of this poem that is present in the Bikuni Samyutta translated by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. And before we start talking a little bit about Dhamma, uh, we can um, pay homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're all gathered here today. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Uttam Tamam Sangham Namasami So at any time, if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to type them in in the chat and then we can either address them as they come or address them at, at the end, because I know that sometimes um, I can go on and on <laughs> um, talking on my stream of consciousness and uh, then it might be a lot of information and people might forget what they wanted to ask. So you're 
welcome at any time to type in any any thought that might appear and I'll try my best to address it. But we can start by reading the poem. I will be reading it from um, my translation. And so the, the poem begins with a verse that says, that which can be attained by the seers, that stage so hard to reach, cannot be attained by a woman with her, with her wisdom as small as two fingers. So this is a verse that is actually attributed to Mara, the first verse. And so, as I was mentioning, um, the poem of um, uh, by Soma in the Trigata has a parallel in the Bikuni Samyutta. Actually, the one in the Bikuni Samyutta was the first one that I had ever uh, read, that I had ever encountered, because I actually read the um, Samyutta Nikaya before I read the Trigata in my um, Buddhist path. And um, obviously, as you might see in the translation of uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, there's a little bit of a backstory, actually, in the Bhikkhuni uh, Samyutta. Pretty much all the poems have a sort of similar backstory where the Bhikkhunis um, go into, um, their, into the forest for their day abiding. And then at a certain point, Mara comes and addresses them with uh, a particular verse. So in the case of Bhikkhuni Soma, uh, Mara uh, essentially brings up <laughs> um, a bit of a sexist trope. <laughs> so um, as actually Bikuni Soma said, actually as the, in the Bikuni Soma, eh, sorry, in the Bikuni Samyutta, mm, the, uh, the, um, the sutta says, uh, the ma Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the Bikuni Soma, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse. So very often, uh, as women um, in um, Buddhist circles, we, we tend to hear something uh, kind of along the lines of what Mara is saying. Um, definitely, that was my <laughs> experience um so I started hearing when I first started practicing oh well it's bad karma to be a woman um it's harder for women to become awakened uh we have more issues than men due to our bodies apparently so uh apparently due to the periods there are ideas that <laughs> we have more anger than um male bodied people and so forth, uh, that uh, we're a little bit more um, subject to sudden <laughs> um, anger crisis, apparently, uh, and sudden irritation and so forth. And I have to say that the first time I heard such things, I was personally quite baffled, um, especially because you take any kind of newspaper or history book, and usually <laughs> it's full of wars and rapes and um, all sorts of, you know, bad actions, but the protagonists are hardly ever women. So I was like, okay, I'm not quite sure about <laughs> women being the masters of anger uh, or of moodiness. If we have to get into these stereotypes, I think the stereotypes in Buddhism are a little bit, <laughs> a little bit different than, uh, you know, the experience that I had definitely growing up in a non-Buddhist environment. So at the very beginning, it's very easy, you know, if we haven't if we haven't been raised with those um, stereotypes to actually not take them seriously. But as we keep on hanging out in particular environments, um, they, these thoughts can become quite insidious and they can start actually uh, pretty much pervading our mind. Uh, we can start taking them as um, working hypothesis which could be, which could have, you know, a kind of two sort of possible scenarios. One possible scenario is that it's a great working hypothesis because we should doubt uh, pretty much everything in the Dhamma, not in terms of skeptical doubt, but in terms of like our understanding of the Dhamma, what is our um, true understanding of awakening, what is our true understanding of the teachings of the Buddha. And that is like a healthy doubt. Um, but when it comes to our capacity uh, towards awakening, uh, when it comes to um, you know, our, our fears of whether or not 
we're capable of practicing this path fully, that we actually have a shot at what the Buddha is, um, you know, offering us as the prize, as freedom from suffering, well, that then actually gets into the, it's into a hindrance, into something that can be pretty much an obstacle towards awakening, both in terms of our mind um, in meditation, you know, a hindrance coming into meditation, but also a hindrance that might even, you know, pretty much crush us in all our daily activities, whether we have robes or not. So it's quite important actually to see um, how in this sutta, uh, you know, it's not the Buddha, it's not one of the arahats, but it's Mara that is actually presenting such a thought. And in the whole Bhikkhuni Samyutta, and also in all the parallels within the Terigata, we see that it's always Mara that actually brings up a thought, brings up a suggestion um, in the Bhikkhuni's minds in order to stray them from um, meditation. There's actually a parallel also in the um, Samyutta Nikaya with um, um, the ma with Mara uh, doing exactly the same thing with the Buddha. <laughs> so trying to instill all sorts of thoughts in the mind of the Buddha. But similarly to the Buddha, all the bhikkhunis um, were all fully enlightened <laughs> when Mara was trying to attempt this. So we see that um, both here in the Trigata uh, as well as in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, they are all first, you know, kind of like hesitating and going like, oh, who is this? Uh, what is you know, this kind of um, thought, um, this being, and but immediately they recognize that it's Mara, the evil one, and the intention of Mara that is trying to stray them away from concentration. It's no different than the Buddha. So Mara doesn't have any type of, you know, foothold on the, on the mind of the bhikkhunis. Um, and so, yeah, we see that um, then Soma in this um, in this sutta says, replies, how does being a woman have anything to do with a well-collected mind when knowledge is present and one sees brightly into Dhamma? Unfortunately, in the Tirigata, we're missing one of my favorite parts, which I will read from Venerable Kobadi's um, version um, that says, one to whom it might occur, I'm a woman, or I'm a man, or I'm anything at all, is fit for Mara to address. Then in the Tirigata, we actually have another um, verse that says, in this way, all zest is killed, the mass of darkness destroyed, thus be aware, wicked one, death, you are destroyed. And then once again, we go to the Bikuni Samyutta that finishes with the Mara, the evil one, realizing the Bikuni Soma knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. So getting back to the beginning of the word, the, the verse, uh, we see that um, essentially, well, Bikuni Soma is, um, as we were, uh, fully awakened. Uh, so uh, she's declaring here in this word, in this verse that there is both, um, when there is both samadhi and vipassana essentially um, in the mind. So the mind is fully concentrated way, well. <laughs> and uh, so there is um, essentially wisdom and unification of mind. What does having a female body have anything to do at all, right? And what does it mean once he's right truly into Dhamma? Essentially, essentially what Bhikkhuni Soma is declaring there is that she understands dependent origination. So she understands that also this state of being a woman is something temporary. So of course, we all know that the teachings of the Buddha um, you know, are very focused on the three characteristics that everything, every phenomena in the world has three characteristics, the characteristic of anicca, of impermanence, the characteristic of dukkha that is normally um, translated as dissatisfaction or um, suffering rather, and the characteristic of anatta, of not-self, so that it's impersonal. So essentially also the body, is a temporary state of being. So we've been 
women, we've been men, uh, we've been intersex, we've been animals, female animals, male animals, intersex animals, and so forth. We've been all sorts of genders. We've had all sorts of sexual orientations. We've been pretty much everything at all, <laughs> everything, every single thing. Um, the only thing that we haven't been is fully awakened beings. And so when it comes to Buddhist practice, it's not the body that gets enlightened. <laughs> the body is just the body. Is it? The body is just a tool. In the Vaseta Sutta, actually, the, the Buddha is completely clear in terms of um, actually elencating all, all sorts of ways through which, as human beings, we like to differentiate each other. Um, so he talks about both genitalia and also color of the skin and also um, caste systems and also all sorts of different ways through which we like to think that we're different from one another. You know, it was like that 2,500 years ago and uh, in ancient India, it's no different today, <laughs> wherever we are. Right now I'm in America, same thing. I go back to Italy, same thing. I go to Thailand, same thing. Perhaps there is a different nuance, right? Maybe in different cultures, there is a bit of a, more of an emphasis on one particular difference. Here in the United States, there's definitely a big emphasis on race due to different historical reasons. Um, in Thailand, definitely, there is a huge emphasis to this day on, on gender, or actually rather on sex, sex and gender. And in Italy, well, definitely the latter, <laughs> but mostly on class. And that I would say probably in all European societies that, of course, have, um, you know, different overlaps. Each one of these three has different overlaps with, uh, with race and with gender and so forth. But there's always like a salient sort of um, salient form of experience in each one of the societies. And one of the interesting things of living in such a globalized world and um, actually perhaps spending some time and living in, a, in, a, in different cultures for, for periods of time is that we can actually get an insight of how absurd this is. <laughs> and also how hurtful it is when we are actually on the part of being um, the ones who are all of a sudden at the end of the caste system. And but we also see how temporary this can be and how, you know, it can shift just by taking a plane. <laughs> um, when I went to Asia for the first time as a monastic, um, it was shocking to me that people would not listen to me not everywhere, but in certain, certain places, you know, I would, I was talking and people were just like, talk to my hand, kind of like Bikuni Soma with Mara, <laughs> but in a, a less enlightened way. <laughs> and it was really hurtful. I had never been ignored in like such, um, yeah, uh, such an intense way uh, in my entire life. I had never felt like I was completely inexistent it was shocking to me I did not realize I was actually really a woman until I went <laughs> to a place where um yeah this body meant so many different things on where you were in the in the social hierarchy it was also interesting in one of the um places that we went um I was there with Bhante Sutazo, that is also the co-founder of the organization. And uh, we were sharing, or rather he was sharing, because uh, people weren't very too very interested in what I had to say, as I was mentioning. Um, but he was very clear in, you know, highlighting how both of us were the, the founders and the creators of uh, all the different things that we had done in the United States. And it was really, he was very gracious about it all. Um, and at a certain point, we were traveling with uh, two other bhikkhus, and they took this picture <laughs> of all of us. And um, then afterwards, when I returned to the United States, I saw this picture, and um, I had actually been cropped out. And there was a caption that said, Bhante Sudazo and these two other bhikkhus that are the co-founders of um, <laughs> Buddhist Insights in the United States. <laughs> it was shocking to me. Um, so shocking. I still remember it to that 
that day, but it was also so, I was so grateful. It was the worst and best thing that ever happened to me in the way that it was such a big, incredible Dhamma teaching, because in that moment, actually, I had the answer of that kind of lingering question that was always on the back of my head. Where are all these bhikkhunis, you know, since the time of the Buddha, where, where did they disappear? And they're all like, you know, lots of sort, sorts of mythologies floating around in, in Buddhist circles and also floating mythologies um, or, you know, glimpses actually of history here and there, but it's difficult to connect the dots. But also there was questions of like, where are the women artists? Where are the women um, doctors? Where are the women... <laughs> in any type of uh, place in history and so when I was cropped out I finally got the answer <laughs> it's not that they didn't exist they just got cropped out <laughs> so it's not that I didn't exist as the you know the co-founder of Buddhist insights but I just got cropped out just like that in in one moment and so we can you know be very easy and um in kind of overlooking uh, the intensity that all of all of these acts can happen within our communities, we can very be we can be very quick and jump to also what is suggested here in in this sutta of like, okay, what does being a woman have anything to do with uh, concentrating your mind? You know, actually, as women, we have a lot of different places where we can meditate all over the world. So, you know, usually we can say, oh, okay, whatever. What's the big deal? Come on, Bikuni Soma, you can still uh, <laughs> current Bikuni, present Bikuni Soma, you can um, still do your meditation retreat wherever it is, even without being a Bikuni, you know? You don't have to go through all of this. What does womanhood have anything to do at all? Well, the fact is that actually having any type of um, body, you know, what was really clear to me, actually uh, traveling um, in those circumstances was that when, for example, I had first entered uh, different monasteries um, and heard, oh, it's bad karma being a woman, I was laughing about it, right? Like I was telling you, like I was sharing earlier. But then after a while, as I was also sharing earlier, these thoughts start creeping into our minds. And so for the first time, actually, um, after didn't take that long after a couple of weeks <laughs> I was a very insecure insecure monastic I was very much doubting my abilities I was very much um, fearful of pretty much anything that I was encountering and it was a big obstacle in meditation it was a big obstacle in pretty much anything that I was doing and it was also there another like incredible big teaching of anatta actually that we think I am a confident person I am <clears throat> you know a smart person or I am uh, you know a feminist or I am whatever it is that we think we are but actually it's dependently arisen that's just a product of different causes and conditions that we put in place. And so when we change those causes and conditions, automatically, the product will be something else, which in my case, in fact, after two weeks, didn't take that long, as I said, <laughs> was insecurity, was depression, was um, fearfulness, and so forth. Incredible, incredible, just two weeks, it took me. And that's also what, actually, I will be quite frank with all of you today. Um, I was already a monastic, and I was like, I think I want to disrobe. This, this form is not supporting me. Uh, this path is not supporting me. I thought I was on the path towards liberation. Instead, it's actually crushing me. It's, um, it's making me insane and uh, turning me insane and turning me into someone that, um, yeah, is, has more suffering than when they started. Luckily, I, um, yeah, I had many Kalyanamitas that actually saw what I was going through and were very supportive. And, you know, this is also what created the foundations of Empty Cloud Monastery. So a place where that I found supportive for, for my practice, where essentially I wouldn't have 24 <laughs> seven um, refresh to me that I had a female body and that female body meant X, Y, and Z. <laughs> So I realized, I acknowledged that that was a hindrance in my path. And so 
I was like, all right, I don't like this Vipaka. So let me, <laughs> I don't like this result. So let me do, let me create other conditions that are supportive for my practice. And so that personally worked for me. But that's very, very, very important uh, that when we address anatta, which is basically what this sutta is all about, that we understand that, yes, of course, um, a body doesn't define us, physical characteristics that don't define us. But still, from you know this path, while we're on the path, from this point until we attain uh, full awakening, this body, these characteristics will affect us will affect us both in the way that maybe we're not actually even um, searching too much, uh, looking too much at the different causes and conditions that have created results in our minds. We think that they are, we think so much that they are who we are that we don't uh, even realize that they're a product of um, just having a particular body in a particular society. And also, it's the way that people relate to us um, that will also have different effects on our minds. So it's very important to, uh, before we go to the stage of transcending the self or of you know throwing the self away that we actually fully understand the self. I think Dogen um, said something uh, along those lines. I forget right now on the top of my head, the tr the his, um, his quote, but uh, it was something along the lines that in order to transcend the self, we have to first understand what is this self that we're talking about and how does this self work and how, um, yeah, how does it come into being and how does it cause a suffering? And we also need to come to a stage of being um, okay with the self that we're currently holding. You know, sometimes also these teachings of anatta in Buddhism are used to oppress many different people that perhaps have gender dysphoria, um, don't feel comfortable with the gender that is assigned to them at, at birth. And so we tend to dismiss their suffering by going, oh, well, there is no self. So like, just forget about it and suck it up and who cares? <laughs> and that's maybe because actually we are not experiencing that suffering um, with the gender that was ascribed to us at birth. We're completely okay. We're completely doing fine. And we're like, all right, whatever. What is the big deal? And that actually is more um, showing that we are lacking in compassion rather than <laughs> think the problem is more ours than the, the problem that the, of the people who are actually instead help in a healthy way, um, essentially talking about the first noble truth, essentially talking about putting forward the fact that there is suffering, that there is dukkha, and that dukkha manifests also by, um, yeah, not feeling quite okay with um, certain gender stereotypes that are posed upon us, right? And so it's, I think it's actually a very healthy thing that anyone could come to um, a point of questioning so much their, the reality that they were born into, the gender that they were assigned to, questioning it and actually going, hey, I think actually this is what is more aligned to, to how I feel comfortable. And then from there, once one gets to that, let's call it quote unquote normality, <laughs> normal sense of self, um, to fully understand that quote unquote normal sense of self and then do the work of really seeing it closely and transcending it and throwing it, um, being freed from it. But of course, it's a, it's a gradual, it's a gradual path. It's not just by reading about not self. It's not just about studying about not self, um, that studying it, I mean, in, the, in, in a book, uh, or listening to it in a, in a Dhamma talk that we transcend it, but rather that we see how it is, you know, um, I have to say that, for me, actually having a female body and um, then taking bhikkhuni ordination, you know, has been a blessing in disguise. At the very beginning, I was very, uh, very much suffering <laughs> about gender discrimination, about all the different issues within um, bhikkhuni ordination. Also that people were relating to me in a particular way based on what I looked like big cause of suffering still is sometimes here and there but actually overall actually I I was like wow this is a blessing in disguise <laughs> I, I never actually even realized what it um yeah 
what this self was, what this atta was, one of the different attas that we have is also both sex and gender. And so to actually unwrap it and see it has only been possible to me because um, of all of these different conditions. So it's been a true blessing in disguise. I remember uh, up until uh, taking up robes, um, I was always behind the scenes at Buddhist Insights. I was never, yeah, in here, like full screen mode, like I am right now. <laughs> Actually, the thought of it, well, still scares me to be quite frank because I'm not fully enlightened. <laughs> But at the very beginning, I thought, you know, this is actually something that I like to do is to be behind the scenes. That's who I am. I'm a behind the scenes person. And it's so interesting because when one starts doing, you know, one becomes a monastic, you know, as a lay person, I was doing everything that I liked and I was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and as a monastic, I do pretty much 99% of the chores and things that I have to do, including speaking in public, is things that I do not like to do. <laughs> but I'm so much happier than I've ever been. It's, you know, one of those counterintuitive teachings of the Buddha. But also, you know, getting back to the being behind the scenes, you know, it was something that um, I had to stop doing as a monastic just because we are a gender inclusive community and so whenever I was behind the scenes actually it was Bhante Sudazo that was getting all the fault <laughs> all the blame like oh Bhante Sudazo is oppressing her <laughs> she's being uh, there like used to do all of these things and I was like oh this is so annoying I just like to be behind the scenes why do I have to da 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 and so Bhante Sudazo was like can you please <laughs> Uh, share some words of Dhamma. Can you please do that? And I was like, no, please, but I don't want to do that. And so then with a lot of peer pressure, I started, um, yeah, taking a little bit more, uh, more front scenes, I guess you call it. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> the opposite of behind the scenes. And it was just so interesting because, for example, I learned that I really like sharing Dhamma, not perhaps in official settings, but I do love discussing Dhamma with others. Um, it has helped me on, it's still helping me on, on, the, on the path, right? So there's so many different things that come up that you're like, oh, is this really who I am? Or is it actually dependently arisen? And then you start noticing, especially living in a gender inclusive monastery, it's really interesting to see then how um, people who have similar traits, whether they're cultural or physical and so forth they all have a kind of similar indoctrination <laughs> and so then you start you know personalizing things uh, stop thinking that's who I am necessarily but start actually seeing how actually this is anatta this is not me this is something temporary that is caused by yeah by different conditions so maybe I can do something else and that's where we see a bit of freedom coming up right from anatta a bit of freedom of like, hmm, I don't have to be, you know, this Italian <laughs> behind the scenes, um, whatever, antisocial woman uh, or whatever it is that um, we, we want to define ourselves. We can see that there's a little bit of flexibility and that actually the more we do something, the more then that becomes um a different trait of our mind and to a certain degree or the other we constantly do that you know if we think about our four-year-old self for example <laughs> hopefully it's very different from your current self for example I wanted to be a ballerina I think at a certain point when I was four years old and then I think when I was five years old I wanted to be a lawyer <laughs> then when I was six years old I think I want to be a farmer and then when I was seven years old <laughs> I think I wanted to be like a vagrant or something. <laughs> I think actually that's the closest to <laughs> the current atta of being, um, yeah, uh, a bikuni, right? Um, so being without a home. But still, everything is, is impermanent, but it just seems like so real, so hard, so, um, yeah, so permanent once again so much who we are as we're living it but as the buddha once again encourages us as the theories the enlightened theories encourage us as the enlightened theras also encourage us when we start delving deeply into dhamma as this series is is also called um and concentrating our mind and seeing how 
how all of this comes into being, we actually essentially see their dependent origination, which doesn't have to be, um, you know, sophisticated philosophical thing that we we talk about during happy hour while breaking the fifth precept and impressing people with our knowledge of philosophy, but rather becomes something that we're seeing useful right here, right now. We're like, oh, with the arising of this, this arises, with the cessation of this, this ceases. When I put all of these things in, in place, then obviously there is this result. And if I remove this stuff, then I get a different result. And that's when the teachings of the Buddha become alive, pragmatic. We start seeing that things also, of you know, there being bad karma to be a woman becomes completely absurd. First of all, it has no foundation in, in the suttas. The only person, once again, who says anything similar and close to that is, in fact, Mara. <laughs> so if we see that, then we can go, Mara, I see you. But we can also denounce it when we hear other people. Um, you know, impersonating Mara, getting their minds um, imbued with Mara's thinking. Go, oh, no, that's Mara's saying, right? So we can be empowered to to do that, but we can also be empowered to to shift things, um, to change things, and to get different um, different results once again. So um, I don't see anything coming up in the chat, but maybe we can. Since I would like to have a bit of more conversation on this topic, maybe I'll stop um, right here and see if any of you has uh, anything to say. Otherwise, I'll keep on doing my stream of consciousness like James Joyce. <laughs> oh, Janaki. Janaki is the first one to question today. Thank you, Ayasoma. Um, it's a very interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to mention something now. When you climb up the ladder um, in the society, the, the hierarchy is such. Now, if you become a president, prime minister, minister, or um, uh, you, you don't have, or chairman, um, you don't have a gender um, uh, specificity whether it's a male or a female, president is president, prime minister is prime minister. We never say prime minister, so for president, I don't know whether there is any term as such. And also the other professions, if you take like captain or doctor, engineer, there are males and females, but still they are all called as doctor or captain or major or um, engineer but uh, there is no female part attached to that to differentiate them from a man and a woman. So likewise, uh, the Buddhism, now it is much higher than uh, any of those uh, professions or what the worldly gains. So because of that, when you reach up to the state of arahanthood, so there is no, um, uh, differences. I mean, when you address them, they are all Arahants, not just, um, we never call Arahanteri or Arahantera. That's what I think, that's what I have found all my life, even in readings as well. So I wanted to mention this one. I just want your, uh, actually your suggestions or your view about this as well, because there was a question last time, I think, uh, that was about, uh, that's a the first Dhammasangayana, so when it was uh, done, um, there wasn't uh, any mention about um, uh, Arahant theories, but when you become a, uh, an Arahant, you, you don't have any self, you, don't, you shed all those things. So there is, you are just an Arahant, uh, neither a male nor a female. So because of that, there was no need to mention whether you are a female arahant or a male arahant. So that's what I understand. And also, if you, uh, I mean, we, we, we know that uh, Buddha has 32 characteristics, body characters. And even then, even the male genitals, are, they are very well uh, re retractile. So it's being absorbed into the body. So you can't say physically whether it's a man or a woman. 
So that's the state that you achieve uh, when you reach the arahanthood, because those things are not necessary. I just won't uh, listen to you or your view about this if you if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Thank so, you very much, Janaki. Yes, that's a um, very good point. Uh, language is actually something very interesting to explore. I have explored it. Uh, myself, I'm still in the process of exploring it, both in terms of the suttas, uh, both in terms of the Italian language that actually is um, derivative from Latin, which is um, an Indo-European language um, that is very similar to Pali. Uh, so there's many things in common. Um, so for example, the masculine gender neutral, and also it's very different from English, well, related to English, but different from English as well. Um, so there's lots of different interesting things that you've brought the, brought here. Yes, of course, our handhood is um, genderless. And also um, we have, you know, all the, the scriptures that we have as an inheritance um, from Buddhism that we kind of like look for our answers, uh, look for, yeah, answers to our questions, to our, as our point of reference. <laughs> Um, they are the product of the oral tradition, right? And the oral tradition, um, we tend to have a very kind of uh, dogmatic way of approaching it, uh, usually. Um, we tend to think of it as actually either, you know, kind of set in stone, like very fixed, like no different than writing, or we tend to kind of dismiss it altogether going, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's been recreated and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not really that reliable, uh, but actually I find it quite interesting as when we one sees in uh, Western culture, like Socrates actually was quite opposed to uh, the form of writing uh, when it came uh, through. And one of the things the oral tradition uh, was um, a way through which actually instead of um, you know, giving a piece of information to someone and that someone um, kind of taking that information mindlessly without thinking of uh, the oral tradition allowed a uh, way of transmitting information that created the conditions for an inquiring mind to come into being. And so the Buddha see that actually throughout uh, the suttas that we have, um, is actually very much, you know, both in the Kalama Sutta or in the instructions that he gives to Sandaka and the Sandaka Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya, 76, if I remember correctly, uh, but also in other different places, he essentially says that if we rely solely on the oral tradition, um, some things, you know, are transmitted correctly and some things are not transmitted correctly and that we shouldn't be relying thinking that truth is just what has been given to us and uh, transmitted to us. So, of course, when we get to the first council, um, I mean, there is a lot of different <laughs> interesting things that I personally, you know, I get a lot of damasuka when I uh, <laughs> when I read most of the suttas, um, but in the Vinaya Pitaka, I can be a little bit uh, less quite so. <laughs> some things are give me a lot of damasuka as well. Some others are not that inspiring. And I have to say the first council and second council contain a lot of uninspiring content. And um, a lot of it that is actually in contradiction with Dhamma. A lot of things that are in contradiction with um, both what the Buddha said, both, you know, you know, actually even when especially when we were talking about gender, uh, when it's brought up, um, if I remember correctly, I think um, after the declaration of not adding anything that one shouldn't add anything to the Vinaya, then uh, allegedly the monastics tell Ananda that he has committed a bunch of dukkatas by um, <laughs> Uh, convincing the Buddha to ordain uh, female monastics or mm, to allow the female monastics to cry on the Buddha's um, remains and so forth. Uh, and so they're basically adding dukkatas that are not in the Vinaya, which is essentially like an incredible contradiction to what has been stated before. And so I think that, you know, once again, um, goes under the umbrella of what has not been transmitted accurately. Um, and it's actually 
you know, when you think about patriarchy, you know, patri a patriarchal system um, that worldwide has been um, pretty solid for several thousands of years now, uh, but and that to the point that most people actually think that that is the state of things. Most people think that it's unquestionably like the status quo. Um, I remember actually it was thanks to the Buddhist teachings that I got into inquiring this. And I found this beautiful book of, that is called The Creation of Patriarchy by Gerda Lerner, who was um, one of the feminist scholars that created actually the uh, university department of gender studies last century uh, that in fact uh, did all this research in history to see when and how um, the patriarchy came into being. Um, essentially, it's because everything is impermanent. So also patriarchy has been, is impermanent. But of course, you know, obviously we've had, we come after, you know, in the past 2,500 years, of course, uh, the status quo pretty much everywhere and unanimously was that women were inferior beings. So the teachings of the Buddha were extremely inconvenient. I find it astounding that we actually still have all this material preserved, all this, um, all these voices of the theories preserved, all this, these, you know, this material, this dhamma actually that is uh, kept preserved, and people like to uh, quote a lot, you know, the adama <laughs> that has been clearly, you know, shown by scholarical, like that actually, um, most of the Vinaya Pitika is post canonical. Um, it's not you know, early Buddhism, so to speak. And of course, there's a lot of misogyny in there. Um, but teachings of the Buddha are, are not. So when it comes to, to language, uh, I'll just finish up by saying that, um, yes, absolutely, enlightenment is genderless. And absolutely, it's true that uh, we shouldn't focus too much the attention, but it's also true that it can be very difficult. For example, uh, when you see Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations of the Pali Canon that are excellent, but actually because in English, usually they're, um, you know, mm, there's monks and nuns or something like that. <laughs> and it's very uh, specific in the language whether one is male or female, then all the suttas are addressed to male monks, which actually, for example, in Italian, uh, we have monaco e monaca. Uh, so it's male monk and female monk, and the plural is always monaci. So actually <laughs> it works exactly like Pali. So the, the gender neutral is the masculine form. Um, that has been kind of the default from all the Latin languages. So the problem is that sometimes then we put our biases in as a culture and we eliminate a big segment of society from it. So I think it's very important to highlight that there is, you know, both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, that there is the tirigata and the, and the tiragata. And I think actually the Buddha, that's why also... Um, you know, is pretty clear over and over again that, um, yeah, that every single person, also lay person and ordained person, you know, that it's possible and accessible to each one of us uh, because representation matters in the sense of the way that we understand that of this path is accessible to us. And so, yes, you know, at, at Empty Cloud, we use monk as gender neutral, for example. So I define myself as a female monk um and male monk but actually these days i'm kind of like more mm, tending to toss the whole monk uh, out altogether and just use bhikkhu and bhikkhuni i don't understand why with every single religion we call people with their names imam rabbi why do we in in buddhism keep on using terms that come from a religion that is not buddhist <laughs> that is christian <laughs> And why are we using these terms that are essentially the byproduct of colonization? Another, you know, whole um, set of set of things. So yeah, these days I'm kind of like, yeah, we should use the the names that we have that are international everywhere. Biku, Bikuni, Samaneri, Samaneri, um, Tilashin, and so then we also understand the different non vinaya forms as well. So anyway, this was long story, extra long. So I, I apologize for the really long, <laughs> long answer, but you put a lot of 
a lot of meat on the fire. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yes, of course. And you also said that, which is really very correct, uh, that the uh, uh, enlightenment or the awakening is attained by the mind, not by the body. It can never be done by the body. That's the most important thing. I mean, all the Buddhists should remember. That's so. Thank you so much, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you. And Ling has comment. Thank you so much, dear Ayasoma. Um, I just um, had a question about um, when you mentioned about shift attention uh, from those dark thoughts, um, like when when Mar Mara is talking to us. And how do you have any um, skillful means can help or recommend us to shift those attention, you know, the one you had your experience and to more wholesome one? I hope this is is it clear? Thank you very much. Your voice was cut off a little bit, but I think I, I got the, the question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that the Sabasava Sutta is the um, point of reference, um, to, uh, where the Buddha actually gave us some really precious pointers, precious instructions on how to deal um, with um, all sorts of <laughs> different situations. Uh, but ultimately, to sum it up, actually, we have to kind of see, be very, um, pay very close attention to the effects that different conditions have on the mind. So personally, when, um, you know, there's environments that keep on um, projecting really harmful thoughts or creating harmful thoughts in your mind. Well, I think that that is in the classification of taints to be completely, to be transcended by avoidance. So get out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> so that was personally what was um, very evident to me that if I had to keep on pursuing monastic life I could not be in an environment where every single day I was told that it was bad karma to be a woman or that my body meant that I had to like children for example or that I had to you know be in a particular way like that was driving me insane so my mind wasn't strong enough to deal with that situation night and day so that for me was in the classification of pains to be avoided uh, things to be transcended by avoidance. There are some others that are that then instead can be um, transcended by endurance. So once again, can we endure it? Does it make us more strong? Uh, so <laughs> maybe it can be, I mean, for example, in monasteries, just simply like living with others can be really irritating living with others, regardless of gender. <laughs> or actually sometimes even due to gender, you know, there are so many different things that also play you know, a role in there. <laughs> actually, my mom is currently visiting and she keeps on saying, um, she's amazed about all these like men, you know, doing chores in the monastery. <laughs> And at the very beginning, she was slightly disapproving because, you know, she was born in 1943. So she was like, oh, they shouldn't be doing all these things. But then she was like, actually, it's really great. Yes, yes, this is good. This is good. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, it also means that maybe there are some men that have not been trained at all in doing any kind of chores. So they do it really poorly. Um, and <laughs> well, that's to be transcended by endurance. So not having too many expectations or when they're cooking, that it's something atrocious. Actually, I was very amused once when I went to this Buddhist monastery that is has both a bhikkhu section and a bhikkhuni section. And I was with the bhikkhuni section. I'm still a lay person back then. And we were having this like really great food. It was a Mahayana monastery. So the, the bhikkhunis were all cooking. And um, then actually, you know, my other friend um, was a male and he was in the bhikkhu part and he was every day telling me, wow, the food is really awful at this monastery. 
can't take one single more day. And I was like, are you crazy? This is the best food I've ever had in my life. What are you talking about? But then one day um, we had a meeting with the one of the bhikkhus there. And so he invited me over for lunch. And I was like, wow, this is a ferocious. It was all this bachelor food. And <laughs> And I finally realized that I was just laughing and going like, hmm, patriarchal, like instant um, vipaka right there, <laughs> instant kamma. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you're, you're reaping all your results, the <laughs> bad results <laughs> of this terrible food. But jokes aside, you know, there is, um, we need to see can we endure that? Yeah, we can endure that. That is not really affecting us in a way that is unbearable, but rather is strengthening our mind. So I always like this um, Zen saying, you know, the teacher that goes to the, um, sorry, the student that goes to the teacher and asks him, give me the teaching of a lifetime. And the Zen teacher says an appropriate response. And that's basically essentially our koan that we always have to understand what is the appropriate response in this situation. And so there's a fine line between something that um, really affects us poorly and something that we dislike. And so we need to understand and when it's something that we dislike, then we endure it. When it's something that affects us really poorly, such as self low self-esteem and all of that, that we need to avoid um, because that is very poisonous. That is something that is terrible. And so personally, what you know, I've, I've decided to do is also taking um, into consideration that uh, other women, for example, don't have the, the same, you know, great conditions um, that I have for practice right now. So I always keep that in mind and try my best to create when I can, if I can, conditions for everyone, including women, uh, to have opportunities to practice the Dhamma and, um, and have access to the Dhamma as much as possible. Um, so within, so I think Dana also has a big part there of understanding, like making good Kamma uh, so that we, what we don't like that when we are the subject <laughs> of that, uh, that also others don't have to endure that as well. So I hope that that answered. And Rob, I think, has something to say. Hi, good evening. Um, I was wondering if you could um, advise on any particular methods that you like to help with the with penetrating the non-self illusion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rob. Um, well, uh, mindfulness of emotions actually really helped me a lot. That's my one of my main meditation practices. I think I spoke about it last time. I don't remember. I think so. Did I? Forgetting. <laughs> uh, but essentially, you know, that's one of my favorite suttas actually of the Buddha in the Samyutta Nikaya uh, that I uh, don't remember on the top of my head the, the title, but it's also the one where actually the simile of the monkey mind comes from. And it's basically where the, the Buddha describes how we, you know, can somewhat easily um, come to understand that the body is not who we are, is not our atta, doesn't belong to us. And for example, we, we notice that when we break, you know, our leg or whatever, we don't just expect it to heal magically just with the power of the thought and wishful thinking. We actually put different causes and conditions into place and we get the result of healing the, the body. But when it comes to the mind, you know, uh, to consciousness, that's where we actually get really stuck. And that's what we think, that's who I am. I am the hungry person. I am the Italian person. I am the whatever person I am you know i am female i'm male i am creative i am scientific or all of these you know kind of more abstract things but those are the ones that really you know we glue to um so by investigating actually the physical component of the emotions so when it comes to anxiety when it comes to uh, happiness when it comes to uh, sadness when it comes to grief experientially when we see that there is a physical component that is constantly changing whether we like it or not whether we want it to be there or not uh, that manifests and then disappears on its own and that is the product of um, 
things that we've done in the past um, that is now manifesting and that in every moment we can create new causes that will create new um, new effects, then that becomes an experiential way of understanding anatta, essentially, uh, of understanding that, for example, in this case, the emotions are not who we are. And then just by analyzing you know, our day-to-day, -day, um, aside from from meditation practice, where we, sorry, uh, we always uh, observe the three characteristics of anicca, anatta, and dukkha, uh, then also in daily life, like in every single moment, noticing, reflecting, pondering how we're constantly changing from one year to the other year, especially for Dhamma practitioners, actually, we change even more, like, in a more fast than the average person because we're intentionally actually <laughs> looking at that and so when we also see the process of delusion eroding you know the process of yeah of how maha starts disappearing um in hindsight we can see oh like wow i had a lot of more wrong view when i first started this practice for example um then that's also where we see how our kind of sense of self is eroding, how we're a different person, how we're constantly changing. So these are some, some thoughts. <laughs> Didn't, I don't know if that helped and you're welcome to give a follow-up as well. That's fine. All right, I think we're, oh. Janaki says, isn't letting go or detachment mentally a good way to achieve non-self state? Thank you. Uh, letting go and detachment a good way to achieve non-self state? Yes. I mean, of course, letting go is uh, <laughs> uh, the recipe of um, not having suffering. So yes, of course, um, if we let go of everything, um, we, we don't, there's nothing to suffer anymore. But of course, it's easier said than done because there's so much that that sticks to us especially we have this saying actually when uh, you think you're enlightened go and see your family right now my family is visiting oh wow I know I'm so unenlightened there's so many things that usually <laughs> you know I thought like I had transcended actually <laughs> until my brother came yesterday and like started you know, making a bunch of different comments and whoa, they were so triggering. And I was like, wow, I thought I had let go of that. <laughs> Instead, bam, it's right there back haunting me, right? So yeah, it's humbling. It's also a humbling practice of understanding what needs to be done. I think Hajan Shah was saying something along those lines. Most of the practice is knowing what needs to be done and knowing that we're not capable of doing that just yet and being you know, so kind with ourselves and going, all right, yes. Um, I understand that this self is not who I am. That doesn't belong to me. It's not permanent, but I still attach to it. And I still attach to my views and my righteous indignation is there and all of that. And, um, and be forgiving, understand that this is just part of the practice and that the important thing is that we're on the path and the path will lead us to the cessation of suffering. And thank you very much, Isoma, for your open, honest, and thought-provoking talk today. And also for the whole Terragata series, which I think will give us all reason to delve deeper into the Terragata and also reason to progress a little bit closer towards our spiritual path goals. So I am posting quite a few links which are not very well edited onto the chat box. The first one is part one of the Terragata series. Second one, part two. Part three, today's talk will be post posted on the Anu Camper YouTube channel quite soon. And then there's another link, which is about four lines long, <laughs> which is the ebook of Ayasoma's translation of the Terragata. So if you'd like to read not just the translations we've talked about over the past days, but all of the translations, then they can be found via this link. And they're also available on Suta Central online. 
And if you would like to find out more about Ayasoma's work and her monastery, then please visit emptycloud.org. It's a really interesting website with lots of links and lots of places to explore further. And of course, if you'd like to donate and support the Anacampa Project, then please visit anacamperproject.org forward slash donate. And for the very last thing today, I would like to announce yet another event. Last week, I announced some other events which still had tickets. And this one is the New Year's retreat with Venerable Chanda, which is going to be online with the Sheffield Insight Meditation Society. It can be found on the website of Anukampa at anukampaproject.org forward slash events. So if you'd like to join Venerable Chanda for a few days of retreat over New Year, then please have a look and she'll be delighted and we'll be delighted to have you there. And thank you again to Ayasoma and we'll see you again, hopefully, on the 4th of September. I'm very much looking forward to that. So I'll now give everybody the opportunity to say goodbye.